My husband and I adopted a little street kid that had been run over by a bus and was very crippled. He came to us on the 31st of October 1988 and he's never left us since then. And uh, that was the beginning of something very big. I was working in the UN for the very poor around the world. I thought I knew a lot about the poor, but it was this little boy that taught me everything. So we started what I thought would be a small club of the 50 beggars who had all been very kind to my adopted sons, because we adopted three small street kids uh, 22 years ago. And I felt I had a family relationship to these mothers. But what I never in my wildest life had I th thought that we would start a huge new organization. But the women had a different idea. So in the 11 years that we have existed as Jami Bora, we have grown from 50 beggars to 300,000 members. We have just become a regulated bank. We are not just a small Mickey Mouse organization anymore. We had never planned to be a big organization. If we had planned that from the beginning, I would have done like everybody else. I would have looked for the best experts. We would have rec recruited all of them and so on. Now, since I only, I, I thought I had retired and it was just a club of some of the mothers of Waitaka's friends, you see. Uh, I, we just did it ourselves. And very soon it turned out to be the most brilliant way of doing things. So all our staff are recruited from the membership. We are using ex-beggars to the ones who joined us in the very early days and who have come out of poverty to talk and coach and advise the beggars from the beginning. And that's a very key department in our organization because they have to get out of that beggar mentality. They can never make it in life unless they realize that maybe it's true, maybe I could also be something else but a beggar. And you see, by seeing then the friends they had in the streets who used to be beggars sitting next to them begging and now having their own business, that is what giving them courage. And it's always the brave ones come first, then the second bravest ones come, and then the second, second bravest. And at the end, even the cowards will dare to try. But we don't give up on anybody. Poor people don't need only one thing to get out of poverty. As soon as we discover a problem, we try to do something about it. The first thing we started was a health insurance, because we realized when somebody was defaulting in paying, it was usually they were either sick themselves or a child was sick. And you, and you know, there is no mother in the world who will risk that her child dies because she can't take her to hospital because she has to pay a loan to Jamibora or any other bank. So we said, this is something we can't beat. We have to do something about it. They need a health insurance and it can't cover just the borrower. It has to cover the whole family. Everybody laughed at us. And uh, we talked to health insurances. They were so expensive, you know. For one person, uh, very expensive, would never have worked for us. So then we decided we'll do it ourselves. That's what we have done with everything in Jamibora. I think many of these studies are showing the wrong picture because they don't understand the poor. The, the, the mothers are the same all over the world. They will not get a ni nice dress for themselves first. They will start with making their kids better, obviously. And the pride in her life is, my children are in school now. I even have one in secondary school. Do you, do you understand that? That is different from saying, this mother doesn't live in a better house yet and she doesn't look different from what she was when we started. But I think we are also different from most microfinance organizations because we have always taken a holistic approach. 
you see. You cannot do everything with microfinance. There is the need for health care. There is the need for education. When they start growing in their businesses, if you start with selling a few vegetables per day, you don't need to do major research on how to do it. But when you have five businesses and, you're, and some of your customers want to pay by check, you know, then you need training to handle that. So that's why we started our business school. The dream of a, a better home, getting out of the slums, is a, that is an unthinkable dream in the beginning, because they don't believe that anything else is available for them. But when they start seeing that Jamie Bora has the housing program, I can save for that, I can show that I'm a trustworthy member, I always pay my loans, then I can qualify for a housing loan. That's the dream, and that helps us to make them very faithful in paying their loans. Because if they haven't been faithful in paying their loans, they cannot achieve that big dream. A family with one addict is a family that cannot rise. Because that addict, if it's a son or a husband or what it is in the family, he will steal the money that the mummy earns from her little business because of the addiction. And if, if he doesn't, if the mummy is good enough to hide the money so that he can't find it, it will beat her up, you see, to get it. So we, we learned very soon that if we're going to help the family get out of poverty, we have to do something about addiction. And we started with, uh, that is about eight years ago, we started with that. And we started by employing uh, two people who, ha who were trained counselors and they had been addicts themselves. All the good counselors are people who have been addicts themselves and come out of it. We had 120,000 members at that time and 60,000 lost everything. Now, we had started our disaster insurance half a year before that, but we had not expected half of our members to lose everything at the same time, you know. You expect some here, some there, some there. And that was the first time I had to become a beggar myself. I was calling uh, people that I knew in different parts of the world and I said, help, we are dying. And I don't accept that. So we had some people coming in with assistance and we put all that money in our disaster insurance. So our members never knew that there was donor money there. As far as they were concerned, they were so proud they had the disaster insurance. The impression I had was that you were very, well, cautious at best about donor funds and that you're very nervous about the donors dictating how the operation should work. No, and not. yet, the, what you just told me yes. is about a very positive use of donor donors. money. Yeah, that's true. What's the difference for you? I'm, I'm not nervous about donors, I'm not afraid of them, but I'm cautious. I don't think you're afraid of anybody. No, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> but I'm cautious. You see, we don't want anyone to come in and dictate to us what we should be. If we, uh, when we started, Nobody believed in us. There was no donor who would ever have done anything for us. Um, because we didn't fit the, 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 the model of the day, you know. But I'm an old woman and I have seen how those models of the days have changed from this side to that side to that side. And, and every time all donors come together and say the same thing at the same time. And I've always been against that. I said, you'll never go forward if you don't let some people try something very different and see if it works. Commercialization is not a problem, um, but commercialization as the main target, if you want to bring the poor out of poverty, is devastating. That's dangerous. And uh, you see, I'm old enough and tough enough that I can be very friendly to those guys and say it's very nice meeting you, but I will not take money from you. There is a difference bet between 
covering your costs and having a safe margin and looking for how to earn most money the quickest and get the biggest bucks, you know, in the fastest time. They can go to other banks. Those guys, <laughs> they don't have to come to us. The biggest reason for the success of Jami Bora is that we started working with the very poor. They became our staff. All our staff have grown out of the worst kind of poverty and they know what it is like and they know the people that they talk to. That's a scary thing for most institutions. Most institutions start by choosing the best PhDs and the best, uh, most knowledgeable people and many of them don't even dare to walk through one of the worst slums unless there's a police officer beside them, you see. You can't change things if you don't work with the right people. And I give the credit, the biggest credit, to a six-year-old boy called Waitaka, who became my son 23 years ago. Uh, because he is the one who first took me out and, and made me meet all his friends, and through them I got to know their mothers. So don't underestimate even the kids. They can do a lot of things for us if we listen to them properly. Ingrid Magnor, thank you so much.